Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher at your service, and this is part number two of a two-part video, and it's numbered uh, 842, where I am cutting a gear on the Atlas lathe using the attachment that I made. So join me, make sure you have watched part one, or this may not make any sense to you. Of course, it may not make any sense anyway. Let's get started. All right, let's start the setup here on the Atlas Craftsman 12-inch lathe. Now, I've already got the holder here in the spindle with a thread protector. And this is a half-inch bore here, which you cannot see, but it looks very similar to this. Only it is a number three Morse taper, so it fits directly into the spindle. And now I will take my homemade arbor and line up this flat with this set screw and tighten it down securely. I might also add that there is a drawbar at the end, just a piece of threaded rod that will pull that cutter into the headstock taper and there's just no chance of it working its way out. Don't take any chances. Okay, the speed of the machine is set at 211 RPM because the cutter is one and three quarters diameter. That gives us an approximate uh, cutting speed of 100 feet per minute, you know, in that ballpark. Again, that is back gears. Maybe I just said that. And I will be using the power cross feed, and that is set at its lowest feed rate, slowest feed rate, perhaps I should say. And notice that the cutter is mounted backwards such that I need to run the machine in reverse and that is why I had that multi-part video on how to wire up this switch because in all the years that I've had this machine I really never have needed to use a reverse but now I do need to and in a minute here you're going to see why I need reverse rather than forward. I'll cover that when the time comes. I would tell you not to use a three-jaw chuck for this gear cutting operation or any operation where you are running in reverse because you could very well spin the chuck off. Now this is kind of a weird tailstock center that I have here because it's extra long. This is what a normal dead center would look like but I wanted the extra reach because there will be interference here if I use a short one or if I try to use a ball bearing live center so that's my purpose now no one's going to have one of these so I don't know what you're going to do but I am using the CMD extreme pressure lube because it's a dead center needless to say I have removed the compound and mounted the uh, milling attachment directly onto the cross slide so I'll set this off to the side and the two bolts right here are tightened and I zeroed it out here there's a little protractor right here you probably can't see it if you don't think that's accurate enough you can indicate this in but I think that probably would be overkill now notice here that when we raise and lower this and finally get our correct depth that this is the lock and I will lock that and that will stay locked for the entire operation. And now the attachment will be mounted in here and you have to decide how far in you want it. And you can see by the little peck marks here that I have moved it a couple times but it helps if there's plenty sticking out here but yet you want to keep this as rigid as possible. Now if you don't want the marks there there is this little steel plate that came with the attachment but I don't think I'm going to use that because these cup screws really bite into this so that there will be really no movement at all so right in that position and I'll tighten these down make sure you're pushed in tight against the vise so this is square and not crooked. Also this entire part of the attachment can be set at different angles so there's another little protractor right here make sure that it is at zero and that the two bolts here are tightened one here and one on the other side because you do not want that to swivel slightly as you're cutting. 
By the way, we are cutting a spur gear, which is the simplest type of gear that there is. And I don't think that this setup could cut any other type of gear. But if you look in the original catalog, the Atlas catalog <clears throat> from 1939, you're going to see that they are cutting the gear from underneath. Now that won't work, and I'm going to show you why. Also, I'm going to show you that picture. But since I am cutting it on the top here, that is why we need to run the gear cutter in reverse so that we are not climb milling. You do not want to climb mill because we got... Can you see the backlash here? So if you climb mill, it's going to jerk that out and damage the cutter or just something. It's going to cause havoc, so you don't want to do that. But now let me show you why we're not cutting on the underside as the picture shows. So now I am raising the entire attachment up as high as it'll go. And the problem that you're going to see here is that it doesn't go high enough. Let me move the camera. Hopefully you can see from this view that I cannot raise the work up high enough to cut it from underneath. Why is that? Well, here's the reason as far as I can figure it out. <clears throat> this is a 12-inch lathe. They did not make a 12-inch Atlas in 1939. They were 10-inch machines. So whether or not they were selling this exact same milling attachment then, I do not know. But I think that we could cut from underneath if we were setting this up on a 10-inch lathe. I do not know that for sure. But who would want to cut it in this position anyway because you absolutely cannot see what you're doing. The visibility is not there. So I would not want to do it that way. But if we were cutting from the underside, then we could run the spindle on the lathe in forward instead of reverse. And here is the picture out of the 1939 catalog where you can clearly see that they are cutting on the bottom side of the gear rather than the top side. Now here's something that's really important. The cutter must be on the center line of the shaft or the center of the blank, whichever way you want to put it. We do not want to cut the gear off center one way or the other. It will be ruined. It will not work. So I must locate the exact center. How am I going to do that? Let me zoom in here and show you something. So I did some measuring while this was still on the bench. I didn't want to tell you about it just yet. But the hole going through the aluminum block isn't necessarily right on center. But I measured on the distance from the edge to the center of the shaft is 757 thousandths. And then the, the thickness, half the thickness of the cutter is 76 thousandths. So I need to move, once I touch off with the cutter, right in that where the wiggler is, I need to move 833 thousandths and that will move me so that the cutter is on the center of the gear or the shaft. I've said that three times. And this is what I mean by touching off. Watch now as I bring the aluminum up against the cutter. Now you could use a piece of paper in there or something if you want to get a little more accurate, but I can feel that I'm right on the edge. So now I am going to move the camera and show you how I'm going to move it. The correct amount, 833 thousandths. I will use an indicator because I do not have a digital readout on this machine. You know, sometimes it's difficult to set an indicator up on a smaller machine like this, but this is what I came up with, at least for now. There's a million ways of doing this. But the indicator is touching right here, and the carriage is unlocked at the, at the moment. So now I will move the carriage the correct amount. I'll zoom in for that, and then lock the carriage. That's extremely important that the carriage be locked and not moved until the entire gear cutting operation is complete. Okay, 833. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, thirty-three. 33. Always count out loud to yourself. Nobody's going to hear you and think you're crazy. Next, I have to set the cutter for the tooth depth, which is 108 thousandths. 
I cleaned the work off, got all the oil off of it, and put a piece of clean masking tape on that, and I'll bring the cutter right over the blank, and I'm going to raise the work now up until I'm touching off. In other words, until I see the cutter cut into the tape. Now i got to move in close. It's hard to see, and I'll be using a flashlight. I'm sure that will not show up on camera. Okay, I hit the tape. I don't know if you can see that. Now I need to move the work away. Just a little mark on that, not much. Okay, after touch off, I zeroed out the little graduated collar here. Very difficult to see. In fact, designed for 12-year-old boys with perfect eyesight. And now I will dial it in 108 thousandths depth. So that's one full revolution. Plus 8 thousandths. Right there. And then I will lock that as such. And that will stay locked for the balance of the job. Okay, let me show you this now because it might not show up during the actual cutting. So lift up the plunger and I'm going to start on the red dot. Just a good starting spot and then always tighten up the lock. Remember I made fun of this big bodacious black ugly knob earlier. But now I love it. It's just the right size to give you that pressure. So make sure you lock that for each tooth that you cut. So after cutting tooth number one, I would lift this up and very carefully put it in a number two, lock it, and so on for 30 more times. And here's another thing you will not be able to see once I start cutting. I am going to use the power cross feed, which is this lever. So here's a dry run. Check your setup over and over because finally I'm ready to cut and you can see there's just an awful lot of preparation work. Now this machine is louder than a combine. You may not hear me over it, but let's make some chips finally. Okay, there's tooth number one, and it, it's looking good. The speeds are, are just perfect, I believe. So let's cut 31 more. I won't show them all. I'm sure you're saying, thank goodness. Let's cut a few more gear teeth.
You see how good the visibility is here when we're cutting on the top. You just couldn't even begin to see it if it was down below. I'm not sure I have used this term yet, but this is called direct indexing. Just as simple as it can be. We are essentially copying this gear or this pattern. And there it is. You know, with direct indexing like this, you don't have to worry about there being one skinny tooth and one fat tooth when you come to the end. So it looks like a good gear. I'll have to take it out to examine it. And then, of course, I have another one to cut, which I will do completely off camera because it is a repetition. If the arbor was a little bit longer, I could have cut two gears at the same time. But that is afterthought that isn't going to happen. And since I have another gear that needs to be cut, I do not intend to in any way change the setup. I will simply remove the finished gear and put the new blank onto the arbor. Okay, here it is, and I'm really surprised at how well it turned out. Now, I've got some deburring to do on this side. I'll probably put it back on that arbor and stick it in the lathe for that. No biggie. But this is the worn-out gear, and you can see that it is going to mesh all right. But look at the difference in the shape of these worn-out teeth compared to this. Now, I have another one to make. I'll do that real fast. It's so much quicker to cut a gear or do an operation when I'm not filming it. There may very well be a follow-up video where I make the other gear and mount them on the reversing mechanism here. And of course, I'll, as I mentioned before, I will have to make new shafts. Well, that concludes this two-part video series on cutting a gear. On the Atlas lathe, it worked out too good to be true. Did you enjoy the video? If so, leave me a comment, and I'll see you in my next shop video. This is Mr. Pete saying so long for now.